Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Andrew Natsios, the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs within the Bush School of Government here at Texas A&M. You are in the, those of you who are guests from Houston, you're in the Presidential Conference Center. Uh, we are going to follow a procedure this evening that uh, cards will be passed out by the Bush ambassadors. If you have a question, please write it on the card and then pass it down to the end of the roll. They will pick the cards up. And then Professor Gauz, who will be moderating the discussion, will have the cards in front of him so we can facilitate the discussion. Uh, Pr Professor Gauz, as you may know, is one of the leading scholars in the United States and the Middle East. And so he is going to be introducing our guest, the Consul General. Welcome. Uh, Consul General Katz, we really do appreciate your visiting us. It's an honor for us to have you here with us. But uh, Greg, if I could. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce our honored guest today. Consul General Gilad Katz was appointed as head of post in August of 2017 to lead the Consulate General of Israel to the Southwest United States which is responsible for the six state region of Arkansas, Kansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, and the office is located in Houston. Of course, August of 2017 might not have been the most auspicious time to take up a position in Houston as he was greeted by Hurricane Harvey, but uh, uh, he got a little taste of, of what Houston life was like and what, uh, how Texans pull together in a crisis. Prior to assuming the post of Consul General to the Southwest United States, Consul General Katz held the title of advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. During his tenure in the office of the Prime Minister, he held, among the titles that he held, was head of the Hebrew Correspondence Department and head of the Public Affairs Department. Consul General Katz has a background in policy, communications, and education. He served as political and diplomatic correspondent for the Makor Rishon newspaper in Israel. He also spent a decade in education, including serving as public representative in the Directorate of Education, in the Directorate of the Education Corporation for the Shoham Local Council in Shoham, a municipality in Israel. He holds a master's degree in political science and communications from Bar Ilan University and a ba and bachelor's degree in political science, communication, and history also from Bar Ilan. Please join me in welcoming the Consul General. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? OK. So I don't have to shout. OK, thank you very much. Um, sometimes when I hear people read my bio, I have to pinch myself and say, is this me? Um, and I always would like to say that um, in Hebrew, there's a saying, that means it's like, stop praising me, but keep on doing so. Uh, so anyway, my name is Gilad Katz, and I'm very, very honored to be here with you at the Bush Institute. Um, I'll start, and through the presentation, um, I'll try maybe to say a few things about myself. I will say a few things, and hopefully at the end of the presentation, everything will be... Uh, Clarified. Um, I I'll start even before what I, why I decided to start with this specific picture of this specific person. Um, I usually don't believe in having presentations. I think that the best presentation is the presenter himself. But I was told by my assistant that's, that that's how things work in the United States. So it's not up to me. Um, so this is the presentation, and we'll, off, we'll kick off that right now. This, uh, this guy, his name is Oren Zelnik. He was with me in the military reserves of, uh, of uh, the IDF. I was a paratrooper, and when I finished my uh, duty, I became like all soldiers in combat. We became, we went to the uh, reserves units, and I met him. He was uh, 
a few years younger than me. Uh, and I met him at the reserves uh, uh, unit during my year after year. We do that every year, 30, around 30 days a year. We go out to, we have to. We are recruited and we have to do our duty in any place that we are, um, are we sent to. And his name is Ori Zernik. I have like him, all my friends in the army, we, I met him once a week, and he was at the age of 24 when he was killed on May 24th, 2002. He was killed during, uh, I would say, a battle that I also took place. It was about five, ten, five meters from me when it happened. We went into Tulkarem. This is the refugee camp in a place called Tulkarem. Tulkarem is, I'll show you over, when you see the map, you'll see everything is a different size in Texas. Believe me, everything is different. Anyway, this is a refugee camp. As you can see, the houses are piled one on each other. There are around 20,000 residents. It was est established in 1950. A lot of the Palestinians, this is a refugee camp of Palestinians. They came to this refugee camp from, all, from um, towns and villages around the area that in 1948, when Israel was founded, their villages, for a lot of reasons, and we'll get to it in the, in, in the uh, presentation itself, they were deported, and this is where they live, up to now. And in this refugee camp, like many others, the mainly a lot of terror organizations, Palestinian terror organizations, you use these very packed and piled uh, houses to, from there, they, they uh, send bombers, terror, terrors, Palestinians, to try and infiltrate in the cities of uh, Israel. And many, many times, unfortunately, they succeed and they blow up buses and kill children, uh, women, elderly. And we, in 2002, as you can see, we, the army, it was, I think, the bloodiest terror month Israel has ever uh, um, had. In one, just in one month, more than four, uh, more than four hundred um, Israelis were killed. And because of that, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, he decided that we have to, the army has to do something about that, and therefore he sent the troops into the Palestinian villages. One of the villages, as you can see, is Tulkarem, and we went over there, we caught a lot of terrorists, we caught a lot of ammunition, but as you can see, they fought back and he was killed. He was 24 years old. This was 2002. We're talking about 16 years old. He's, he, if he would be alive today, he would have been 40 years old, married, a few kids. And this is the price of the situation in the Middle East. In a shell nut, this is the price. I'm posing. And now I would just like to start my, pre my presentation from where I come from. Why? I mean, he was a good friend of mine, but I would like to talk about the more professional issue that I, am, I would like to try and share with you. Behind the desk of the Prime Minister, in the last seven years, from 2010 to 2017, August 2017, I was the Prime Minister, the advisor, Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, I was his, one of his advisors. I used to write all his um, speeches and letters and, other, and um, amongst other things in Hebrew. And I had quite a, quite a lot of hours, you can say, behind the desk of the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, but before that, and this is very important, this is the uh, uh, picture that was taken a few months ago. My family, um, this is my wife, Merav. Uh, she is the prettiest and nicest person in the universe. And I don't understand why you just laughed. And these are my kids, same applies to them. Nicest, prettiest, and smartest. But why did I bring this uh, picture? I brought this picture because people, for some reason, forget that even politicians 
at the end of the day, are human beings. They have families, they have their personalities, they have the advantages, the disadvantages, they are human beings. And as such, every, each and every human being makes mistakes, and we have to understand, we meaning the people, the crowds have to understand that even if we're talking about a president, a prime minister, very respectful people, even they are human beings. It, it seems like, you know, very trivial, but it isn't because sometimes we forget that and we think that we can, we have to demand from them only perfect, none less than may, him, them, them being perfect. This is the prime minister. This was the day before I left to the States. Uh, this is prime minister. And now, the, besides, you know, the hand checking and all of that, which is very, very nice, as you can see in the background, there, there is, this is the only picture he has besides his family in his chamber. And the picture is a map, as you can see. And the map, it's not the map of the world, it's the map of the Middle East. And in the, in the a few, uh, another few slides, you'll understand why the, why the Prime Minister has only that specific map, only of the Middle East, in his chamber. When I ca started my um, tenure as, the, as his advisor, as his, as his um, uh, writer, he came, the first, the first um, I would like to even maybe even try to share it with you, the first meeting that I met him as his advisor, and I remember that, I'll never forget it, I was always focused, I always wanted to become, you know, an, uh, an advisor to the prime minister. I mean, it's something very interesting. You work with the prime minister, he has a very interesting schedule, he, he deals with everything that you can even think about. And when I was, finally, I became his advisor, I remember I came to the my first, work, first day at work. I sat at my desk in my office, small office. It's about uh, 100 feet from his office. And they told me that he'll call me up and I'll have to come to, you know, just to introduction and he'll tell me exactly where, uh, what he wants from me and all of that. And I sat down and I waited for the phone call. And then came the phone call and I picked it up and I said, he's, he's waiting for you. Can you, come, can you please come to his uh, office? And then I, I, remember, I remember those 100 feet. And this is what I was planning the whole, my whole career. This, is, this meeting with the prime minister is what I wanted. And I came up to his office, knocked on the door. I sat down. He doesn't have any small talk whatsoever. People sometimes take it personally. I don't understand why. For some reason, people think that Heads of states, prime ministers, presidents are friends. They are not. Believe me, they're not our friends. We're not their friends. It's not their job to ask us, how many children do I have? And what did I eat yesterday? And what am I going to do tomorrow? Why should he? He's not a friend of mine. But a lot of people that work with heads of states, for some reason, take it personally that he doesn't really care about my personal life. I told my colleagues that, believe me, he's not your friend, you're not his friend, forget it. Don't take it personally. They understood me, but they still were offended for time and again. Anyway, he gave me five rules for successful speech writing. And I'll be very, very brief. The first rule was, it has to be short, but not short enough, not, not too short, meaning you mustn't drag on a, 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 a speech for 40, 45, 50 minutes, um, you must rem remember, Israel is a democracy. We're not talking about Castro. That can talk for a few hours. So it must be short, but not short enough. What does that mean? When people come to, li to listen to the prime minister, just think of it. If, he if he'll talk for, let's say, three minutes, people have to come two hours before. They have to go in the inspections of the security. It drags them a lot of time. They finally sit down on the, on the chair, the prime minister walks in, he comes, he, st he speaks for three minutes, and he's out. Now that really offends them. So it must be short, but not too short. You have to understand where things are in the middle, some, somewhere in the middle. The second rule is to make it personal. That means you always have, as a prime minister, you always have to try and 
show the personality, the personal life of the Prime Minister. Since they don't know him, they'll never know him on a personal basis. So it has to be personal if we're talking about saying, uh, telling a story of his personal life or telling story about his friends or whatever. It makes, it, it makes the difference between only talking about what he wants to, about his official issues or when he starts with the story. It, it helps people to feel or connect with the Prime Minister. The third rule is saying something new. In the same meeting that I was, when I was the first meeting with the Prime Minister, he told me, look, every speech I want you to write something new. But he understood that's impossible. And then he added, and if there's nothing new to say, say old things in a new fashion. Now that's very clever, but it's very, very hard. Think of it. He talks about every day. He says, he <laughs> eventually he says the same things. And you have to say it in a new fashion. It's not easy. Fourth, fourth rule is have a goal or a point. Every speech, every speech has to have a goal. That can't be a speech when he comes, talks, and at the end of the day, the people walk out, go to, to the houses, and then they say, okay, what did he want from us? Or what was his intention? You have to remember, heads of states are politicians. At the, they would like to be re-elected. So there has to be a goal or a point. It could be economically, it could be socially, it could be security-wise, whatever. But there has to be a goal. And the, fir and the fifth and last uh, rule is to know your audience. Know your audience meaning if a prime minister comes and talks in front of students, the lecture will be different than if he'll come and talk before soldiers or before elderly. The audience is a different audience. Even if he can say the same, he wants the same goal, he has to understand whom he's, who is sitting in the room, who is his audience. So that's where the five rules of successful speech writing, and I tried to keep each and every one of them in mind. A lot of times he used to call me and he says, why didn't you do this and that? And it wasn't easy, but as I got along with him, it was much easier for me because I got to know him better. First of all, on a, ba on a, on a personal basis, but mainly I knew what he wanted to say. That's the important thing. Now this is Netanyahu himself, a few things that he uh, just to know about his background, because I think each and every one in the room heard the name Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, he is already he is, he's pushing his 10th year uh, as prime minister, straight his 10th year. Tenth year. Um, and it's important only to, to try and get a little of who the person is, not only what you see in the, uh, um, in the media. So he became, he was, the first, he was the youngest prime minister Israel has ever had in his first term. His first term was between the years 1996 and 1999. He was then only 46 years old. I think Clinton was the same age, if I'm not mistaken. And you, there's a, such a big difference between the two people. I just would like to say, I'm not going to say my age, but let's just say that if I was... I would have been already Prime Minister. I'm not going to break the record now. Um, he was the first Prime Minister to be elected three times in a row. In Israel, there's no limits for, for being a Prime Minister. You can be elected, uh, elected and re-elected time and again. He was the first one to be re-elected three times in a row, which is not something you can you know, just talk about. It. It's very difficult in the Israeli society to be elected and three times in a row is something ex extraordinary. He learned uh, at the, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard University. Please, don't take what I'm saying now, don't take it personally, because it isn't. But I, would, I think that his English is better than each and every one of the English in this room. He speaks English. Okay, that's enough. His close friend called him Bibi, and this is only a, a, a thing that I, I knew only, I think it was three months ago or something like that. He had a very far relative that lived in Houston by the name of Bibi. And then I, I asked, how come Bibi and Bibi? I mean, he's known as Bibi. And 
It's, he also was Benjamin, Benjamin. And they told me that there were two BB in the family. There was the big BB, which just three months ago passed away, and this, the little BB. I don't know how little is the little BB is, but that's his nickname. Now, what is the most important role of a head state, of the head of the state? I think this, to answer this question is the most important thing to understand and grasp and apprehend the meaning of head of state. The answer to this simple question, what is the most important role of a head of state? What does he do? Why do we elect them? I think the most important thing is this, decision making. That is what they are elected for, to making decisions, all kinds of decisions. Now, you have to understand, heads of states, mainly the United States, Israel, the heads of states make decisions of life and death decisions. So each decision, and not each decision is life and death. Believe me, there are decisions that are so so minor and so esoteric that, but the decision making is what makes them heads of states. Now, what does that mean, decision making? Well, there are, a couple, there are two different types of decision making. There's the preemptive decision making, which means, and I'll give you an example, and by the example, I think everything will be understood. Israel, for its reasons, and I don't think I have to explain that, is, uh, lives in a very, very disturbing neighborhood. Therefore, Israel, Israel's army, the IDF, has to be on the front line of the, of the technology in the security issue. Israel decided a few years ago, quite a few years ago, that she has to buy the F-35 jets. Do you know where these jets are made? In Texas, of course. They are made in Fort Worth, as you well know. There's little kid Martin. Anyway, when each F-35, do you know how much each one F-35 jet, how much does it cost? Does anyone have a clue? Three million. No, you don't have to uh, don't exaggerate. Three billion is a lot of money. Well, it's a hundred million. A hundred million dollars. I'm not going to say how many jets Israel bought. You understand why I'm not saying it. But Israel bought quite a lot of F-35 jets. We're talking about a lot of, a, a big chunk of money. Now the question is, why should Israel, Israel has, her budget is not unlimited. The decision has to be made. Do we use the money for, just, I'm just saying, for education, health care, construction, infrastructure, security. The decision has to be made by who? By the decision maker. Who, who is the decision makers? The prime minister, eventually it comes to the prime minister's table. And now when he got the decision, Israel has to buy the F-35 jets. He understood that the decision is a long-term decision because hopefully there won't be a war in a year time. And while as long as there's no war, the F-35s are, no one is using them. They're almost, I would even say, they're almost useless. So all of a sudden when there's no money and there's cuts in the budget and there's always cuts, all of a sudden people say, so why do we need so many F-35 jets? Because that's a decision of a long term. A short term meaning, if I will decide now, in a year time, two years from now, people understand why I had the decision. So the preemptive is that Israel understands that we will have to, in before the war, Israel has to understand and make a decision by herself. Do we have to, or how do we have to prepare ourselves for the next war, which no one knows will happen, hopefully it won't. But we'll have to take a decision. That's preemptive decisions. These are the, they are the second type, which is considered to be, I call it, reactive. Meaning, something happened. 
Now the decision makers have to react to the, to, to, to the new reality that has all of a sudden sprung to us. Terror rises in Israel in 2002. Maybe it's the Palestinians. <laughs> anyway, 2002 was the bloodiest year Israel has had in terror since the foundation of Israel. 2002. It was the second intifada, the uprising. People were scared to go out, of, to leave their houses and go on buses. And I'm not joking. That was the situation in 2002. Now, that what, that's what happened in reality. The government has to take a decision. What should we do after the bombing? So what, we, what should we have done? Each prime minister thinks he knows best, but never mind. The military action that was taken in 2002, and we'll, we'll see it in a few minutes' time, was the reactive decision because of the terror rise. That means it wouldn't have been made without the terror against Israelis. As you can see, the military action, I will take, well, I'll talk about it in a few minutes now. Now, this is a chart that has to, and I think, will, will explain everything. This is the year of the foundation of Israel, 1948. We're talking about fatalities from terrorism, only terrorism, not war. That's two different things. In Israel, by the year 1948 to 2017, thank God, even though 2015-16, weren't so easy years, but I'm not talking about these years. 1948, as you can see, this was the foundation of Israel. Around almost 400 Israeli civilians were killed on terror attacks. Since then, as you can see, it went low, it went, and, and it almost, these years were very, very good years. And then, as you can see, from time to time, unfortunately, the attacks, all of a sudden, you can, you can see a, a spike, and then all of a sudden, from nowhere, 2002, look how it goes. It's got more than 450. 2002. Now, do you remember the first slide that I showed you? My friend was killed. He was killed in 2002, May. Because these months were, the, as I said, the bloodiest months. And the, gov and the, sorry, and the prime minister had to take action and he decided, as a, as, a, as, as a strategic decision, that the, the army, first time since the Oslo Accords, which were signed in 1993, the Israeli army will infiltrate the, the towns, cities, villages of the Palestinians because of the terror that, as we can see, the price that we had to pay due to the terror. Now, how much do you know about Israel? This is very, this is a fun part. Because I think I know a little more than you, and I can say whatever I want to say. <laughs> okay, I think most of the people, even here in the United States, don't really know in depth. They don't really know Israel. So this is the first thing I would like you just to understand. Israel has two official languages, Hebrew and Arabic. Why Hebrew? Understood, we're talking about the Jewish people, the Jewish people talk in Hebrew. So Hebrew is the official language. Why Arabic? No reason. Okay, so we'll just throw the Arabic, Arabic away. No, the reason is very simple. Do you know how many Israelis Arab live in, as Israelis live in Israel today? Numbers? Anyone? 1.2 million Arab Israelis live in Israel. Out of how many Israelis altogether? 8.5 million. 1.2 Arab Israelis, and because of those 1.2 million, Arabic is considered to be an official language. Why am I emphasizing that? Because for some reason, some people, they, they stay in Israel as an apartheid state. It's got nothing to do with reality. And I'll just show you slide by slide. Okay, as I said, Israel has 8.547 million Israelis 
This is, oh, it, it's a little, Israel has a little more, but these are the numbers. Jordan, which is our neighbor from the east, has 9.45, almost 9.4, uh, 9.5. Lebanon is our neighbor from the north, 6 million. And this is how we look. This is our neighborhood. I love this picture, uh, this map. You know why? Because with, if I wouldn't have shown you with this arrow where Israel is, I think no one have se would have seen it. Now, this is Israel. This is our neighborhood. These countries that surround us, besides Egypt and Jordan, I'll talk to them about that later, are not our best buddies. And this is how, this is how big we are. Now, as you can see, there's, for some reason, a black stain here. It's on purpose. I'm just talk, I'll talk about it later. But this is the Middle East. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, as you can see, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Yemen, Oman, and all the uh, other little countries. And Turkey, of course. Okay, Texas is 30 three times, I'm saying again, 33 times larger than Israel. Texas. So you have to understand, when we talk about, you know, when I, my parents are here, so I told them we'd have to drive for two hours. I said, oh my God. They started to think about it when they stood in Israel. Two hours. What does that mean? It's shocking. It, I, I almost have, I just told him last night that we're going to Louisiana. That almost killed him. <laughs> it doesn't happen in Israel. Israel, from, from top to bottom, no one does that in a day, but from top to bottom, it takes about five hours. From here to Louisiana. So this is how it looks like. Israel is only 12,905 miles, square miles, and Texas is 432, 885 square miles. I don't know, I think everyone knows that um, Texas is bigger than France. Luckily, it's bigger than France. Who likes France? Okay, Golda Meir, she was the f our first woman prime minister, but, and that's quite, I mean, it's nice, she was in the, sev in the early 70s, she was a prime minister, but I don't know if you ever know, she was the third woman in history that served as the country prime minister head of state. Third in the, in the history. Israel's hub in innovation. I think each and every one of you got to know some of these innovations, ways. I think everyone heard about it. Now, Mobile Eye is, I think, the most recent one. It was sold to an American uh, uh, company, I think it was Google, if I'm not mistaken, but at the price of $15 billion. Um, we're talking about the USB, we're talking about the voicemail, antivirus, and Motorola, all of those, we've all known about it. Israel, a look back. Now we're talking about a little back to the history, and this is the same map that you saw in, in uh, a, few sec a few minutes ago, but the only difference is I, I would like to show you what's happening today in the Middle East. And what's happening today is very, very simple. The bad guys are getting stronger. Iran, which I think each and every one of you knows exactly what Iran stands for, nuclear, terrorism, uh, extremism, radicalism. Iran has succeeded, already succeeded in I call it conquering Iraq, even though they don't really admit that. And now they have already entered Syria, Lebanon, of course. And now, for the first time in our history, Iran, Iran soldiers are on our border. This is, as you can see, there's a little border over here between us and Syria. This is the Golan Heights. All of a sudden, Israel woke up one morning. It's not one morning, but let's be dramatic. One morning she woke up and voila, Iran is on our border. That is unacceptable, according to our prime, to our prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. And I'm not talking about Saudi Arabia that is threatened by Iran. I'm not talking about 
Turkey, which you never know where she stands. I think he also doesn't know where he stands. So we can see Iran is expanding, and it's becoming the biggest threat, obviously, on the Middle East. But to my opinion, on the I would say on the stabilization of the universe, of our planet. This is where, and this is our neighborhood. 1948, a little bit of history. 1948, the British withdrawal, and that's why, that is when Israel was founded. And before that, just I would like to, uh, to show you that before the establishment of Israel in 1947, there was a plan to, uh, United Nations approved the partition. That means there were Arabs that lived in Israel. There were the Jews. And they said, you know what, what can we do? Let's have a decision that divides Israel into two. Israelis, the Jews, even though, even though it was difficult for them because we really do believe that it, this is the biblical land, it belongs to us, but we understood that we have no other option and we accepted that decision. Who didn't accept it? The Arabs. Therefore, what did they do? They started the war against Israel in 1947. And the war was the, I would say, the, 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 the toughest, vicious war that Israel has had since. Thank God we won the war. And then we come, I'm, 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 I'm skipping a forced forward to 1967, Six Day War. This is how Israel, Israel <coughs> sorry, looked like before the war, as you can see. This is the West Bank. And why is it called the West Bank? Because this is the Jordan River. This is the West Bank. And this is the East Bank. That's the only reason it's called West Bank. The real names are Judea and Samaria. That's how in the Bible it's, it's, it's considered as Judea and Samaria. Anyway, after a six-day war, when all the, all the Israel's enemies tried to, uh, uh, um, to, to uh, um, not, only be, not only win Israel, but to destroy Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, they all tried to and they failed. And Israel, fortunately, um, won the war. And, whoa, and we're into this map, as you can see. Israel, all of a sudden, in six days, expanded its borders. All the Sinai Peninsula, which was once in, Egypt, in Egypt's hands, became, went to our hands. And same thing with the West Bank and the Golan Heights. You see how there's no Golan Heights. In the Golan Heights. All of this became part and parcel of the state of Israel in six days in 1967. And then came the Yom Kippur War, which was considered to be a very, very troubling war for us. We had no clue. It was a, it was a surprise. 3,000, more than 3,000 soldiers of, our, of the Israeli defense forces were killed in the, in the war. During the war, the, Arab, the, the Egyptians, the, the Syrians almost uh, released or conquered, sorry, conquered the Golan Heights and the Egyptians, they infiltrated Israel and they got a, a, around 15 miles from Tel Aviv. And then with a lot of, 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 of uh, um, heroism of our soldiers, we, at the end of the day, pushed them back. And Israel was at the same uh, in, uh, situation that was before the war. And then came after 1977 when the Egyptian president, Anwar Sadat, this is this guy, Anwar Sadat, he realized that he could, uh, Egypt will not be able to beat Israel on the battlefield, so therefore he decided to have a peace treaty with us, and this is, this is Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister, and as you well know, this is the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, and this was the peace treaty between the first uh, um, Arab country and Israel, they had the peace treaty between them. And then came 1987, that's 10 years after that, the first uprising, which is called an intifada in, in, in Arabic. What does that mean? As, you, as I said, in 1967, just 20 years ago, Israel released 
the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and these Arabs, Palestinians, live in Judea and Samaria. And they wanted a, a state of their own. So they started the uprising against Israel. It seems like, you know, it's very, it's only fair to give them a state. Like, who doesn't want to give people a state? And that's what happened. In 1993, Pres uh, Prime Minister Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, signed an agreement called Oslo Accords between him, Israel, and Yasser Arafat. He was the chairman of the PLO. And I would like to understand, PLO means Palestinian Liberation Organization. They mean they want to liberate the whole of Palestine. This is very important. They do not, up to this day, they do not believe in the existence of a Jewish state. Not even on a feet on a feet. They just don't believe in it. And even so, they signed an agreement. Why did they sign an agreement? Arafat himself said, this is the first step. It will be easier for us. And after signing the agreement, and this is, as you well know, the, pre the President Clinton, what do you think the next slide will be? What do you think? After a peace treaty, what will be the next slide? Singapore? And this is the, this is the reaction of the peace treaty. They understood that because of the first intifada, which led to these Oslo Accords, if we want to go another step, what should we do? This is what we should do. Reasonable. Why not? Let's kill the Jews. Now, I'm not paranoid, believe me. But sometimes, people really do chase paranoids. It happens. And this is what happened. The second intifada lasted five years, and it was a very, very, as you see, 2000, 2005. What happened 2002? The bloodiest year in, his, in the history of Israel. And this is, was the result, I would even say, a direct result of the Oslo Accords. No one can, in my opinion, no one can uh, um, uh, convince me otherwise. No one even though people do try and convince us that. No one. And now, 2005 to the present day, the situation, and this is the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip, as I said, is between the Egypt's border and Israel. It's a very small peninsula, you can even say. And when we, Israel, on, in 2005, why do I pick 2005? Israel, under the, under the uh, Ariel Sharon, the Prime Minister, uh, disengaged from the Gaza Strip, and today the Gaza Strip is only Palestinians. There are no settlers, no Jewish settlers, no settlements, nothing, just Palestinians. And what would we have think if there's only Palestinians? Come on, become Singapore. Why not? But what do they do? They have started to manufacturing their own mortars, and then Qassam rockets, which are much, their range is much longer, and then grad rockets, and then they have to upgraded the grad rockets to 30 miles. 30 miles is, as you can see, Tel Aviv is over here, is not far from Tel Aviv. Now, that is what you do. You have an employment of 50%. Your education situation is, is, is no, there's nothing worse than that. And this is what you do what does that mean on your intentions? Now, what do the Israelis that live around here, and there are hundreds of thousands of Israelis that are threatened day in, day out. What should Israel do? Pray, of course. What else? Do we want to penetrate Gaza Strip? No. We, as I said, we left the Gaza Strip. So what should we do now? This is me. You know why I like this picture? Because people think I was a hero. 
And the truth is, I wasn't, you know. Now, this is me when I was much younger. I was much, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if today I, for, I could have entered this little uh, hole. So, this is why am I saying what is important? I took part in Operation Defensive Shield, which was in 2002, and Operation Cast Lead, which is in 2009. 2002, I was quite, I was uh, a new wed. I was uh, married two years, and I had one son. 2009, I was already married nine years, and I had already f three children. And still the same thing, if there's duty, they call for duty, we have to come. Now, I would like you to, this is, as you say, as you see, Benjamin Netanyahu. One second, hopefully. Oh, my God. What do I do? And I say Israelis now have to, are high tech. Okay. Please I've just watched a video carefully. that shook me to the core of my being. In just a few seconds, it shows why our conflict persists. So here's a short snippet. A Palestinian father holds up his four-year-old son. He pleads with Israeli border police to kill his own child. He shouts, shoot this little boy, his boy. He pushes his young son forward towards the soldiers and screams, kill him, shoot him. The boy pauses. He's scared, any child would be. He turns back looking at his father for guidance. With his shirt tightly tucked into his bright red shorts, the boy ambles forwards towards the soldiers. One of them extends his hand in friendship. The boy gives him a high five. It's hard to make a four-year-old hate. Imagine your own child at that age. Think of his smile. Imagine her laugh. Picture the unrestrained joy and, and innocence that only a child possesses. Encouraging someone to murder a child, let alone your own child, is probably the most inhumane thing a person can do. What did this child do to deserve this? The answer is nothing. He's innocent. He should be in a playground. He should be in the sun, laughing with other children. Sadly, this father's crime is not an isolated example. In Gaza, Hamas runs summer camps that teach children to value death over life. Suicide kindergarten camps. The Palestinian Ministry of Education in Ramallah recently organized an event for students to honor terrorists who murdered three civilians. Two weeks ago, the Palestinian Authority's official newspaper praised teenage terrorists and wrote that death as a martyr is the path to excellence and greatness. That's a direct quote. Palestinian and Israeli children deserve better. They deserve to live. They deserve to live in peace. Children are not cannon fodder. They're the most precious things in the world. They're the most precious things we have. I'm sure Palestinian parents, many of them, are as outraged as I am at this video. And today I appeal to every father and mother around the world. I ask you to join me in calling for an end to this abuse of children. The Palestinian leadership must stop encouraging children to kill. They must stop encouraging Palestinian parents to call for the death of their own children. It's horrendous. Peace begins with respect. If parents don't respect their own children's lives, how will they respect the lives of their neighbors? We must love all children. They should never be pushed to violence or hate. Join me in educating all children for peace. Okay, so what Netanyahu just said, I think, in a three minutes, is the core issue that now differentiates us from the Palestinians. We extend our hands 
we truly do, we understand the price of peace, we truly do, but where do the Palestinians stand? We're waiting near, uh, around the, the uh, table for more than three, was the last time, when was the last time? Netanyahu, the last time he met uh, publicly uh, the president of the Palestinians was in 2014, now 2018, and we still, Netanyahu said time and again, give me a date, give me a location, I'll be there. Let's talk peace, and since then, nothing has been done, at least from their point of view. Instead of that, what, we have, what, can we, what has been done? Terror attacks updated since 13th of September. Why am I choosing 13th of September? 13th of September in 1992, 1993, sorry, was the day that Israel and the Palestinians signed the Oslo Accords. So just a symbolic date, 2000, since 2015, and this is not uh, updated totally, but you know, it just has only arisen. 62 innocent people have been killed in terrorist attacks. 62 people. I think about the number of the people that are in this hall now. Almost 900 were wounded, and this is astonishing. 1,320 grenades and Molotov cocktails have been thrown. That means we're talking about almost every day. 6,481 cases of rock throwing. Now, rock throwing is almost nothing today, but people can be killed, and people have been killed by rock throwing. Now, what I said is from the Palestinians. We have an issue with the Hezbollah in the north, from Lebanon, as you can see. They have, if the Palestinians, the Palestinians are like a small baby compared to the Hezbollah. The Hezbollah today have more than 100,000 missiles that are aimed on almost any spot in Israel. They can fire and, and hit e every spot up to this range. This is, this is a desert. This is the Hezbollah. And now we're talking business. Because this is Iran. This is Iran, and this is Israel. What should Israel do? After the, after the agreement, the nuclear agreement, what should Israel do when Iran, time and again, says specifically that she will destroy Israel? What should and what can Israel do? What does the decision maker, in our case, Benjamin Netanyahu, have to do? That's his duty. So that's what he says. He, he comes and he almost begs the international community and says, please, for your sake, but also for our sake, please make Iran understand that they cannot have nuclear weapon. Do that. Don't let them. There's the sunset, as we know, that not now, in 10 years from now, but that isn't efficient enough. And Netanyahu says, you've got to understand, if you won't take care of Iran, Israel will do something. What will we do? How will we do it? When will we do it? I don't know. But be sure that if we will be with our backs to the wall, we will do something. That is what will happen. And when that, ho and ho hopefully it won't happen, but if we will get to that point, remember these years that the Prime Minister of Israel begged the international community to listen and understand the big threat, the existence threat of Israel, and no one did a thing, nothing. So I'll end with this very simple, childish question. What would have you, if you have, would have been Prime Minister of Israel, what would have you do or done in this specific situation when you know that Iran would like to destroy Israel? They have the nuclear power, they, or they might have. What can we do? And with that optimism, 
I would just like to, sorry, to just say uh, 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 a few uh, notes that Israel really do, does believe in the next generation. Even though, for some reason, they think oh, a lot of people th blame Netanyahu as being uh, um, uh, a leader that doesn't really care about the next generation. There'll be war if he doesn't do that or this. Israel, all Israelis, all decision makers, all prime ministers do really believe and understand that the next generation, next generations are the most precious things we had, as, as Netanyahu just said in the, in the video. But for us to understand that Israel, this year, 2018, is celebrating its 70th anniversary, we, will, we do want to celebrate our 140 um, uh, anniversary in 70 years from now. To do so, we'll have to protect ourselves in any manner. So I would just like to uh, end with, uh, 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 I would say, a positive note that I really do believe that at the end of the day, uh, Israel will celebrate its 140 and 1,400 uh, um, anniversary. But it's us to, uh, us, up to us and you, the Americans, the, our best strategic allies, to help us um, shape the world, the new world, without a regime that only talks about demolishing the state of Israel. Thank you very much. We, we have our ambassadors who have distributed cards. Uh, I, I want them to collect them because we are, we're on a short schedule. We don't want to keep anybody from dinner, that's for sure. Uh, and so I'd like to, if you, if you do have a question, please get those cards to, uh, to the ambassadors and bring them up. Thank you very much, Mr. Consul General. You're an extremely effective representative of your government. Let me ask you a couple of questions while I, uh, and, and let you respond while I leaf through and see what we can uh, glean from the audience's questions. I hope you were gentle. Uh, well, that, well, we'll see. Um, the Palestinian Authority, as opposed to the Hamas, uh, uh, regime in Gaza, is engaged in, co in security cooperation with, your, with, with Israeli security forces. And uh, while 62 deaths in the last three years, almost three years, two and a half years, is uh, 62 too many, uh, that is a much lower number than the, the numbers that you showed us before. Could you talk a little bit about the level of cooperation? I mean, you, you mentioned that Prime Minister Netanyahu hasn't met with President Abbas in uh, four years. But there is cooperation going mm -hmm. on. That, that does help to secure both populations. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, first of all, they are boots on the ground. That means they are the Palestinian, um, a lot of their forces that work mm -hmm. hand to hand or shoulder to shoulder with uh, the IDF, mm -hmm. but that isn't enough. Uh, the most important thing today, as opposed to what helped was between the uh, Oslo Accords, the signing of Oslo Accords in 1993 and, to, and 2002 is today, Israel is, um, uh, can and does uh, enter each and every um, corner in the Palestinian Authority in uh, Judea and Samaria, and meaning that if there are terrorists that we know of through intelligence, we go night after night and we catch them, and that what stays, and, that, and, and those, um, those um, arrests for the, for the terrorists that is what um, enables the Palestinian Authority to stay alive. Because if we wouldn't have arrested those, um, those uh, terrorists, today the Palestinian Authority would have, uh, what would have happened to her would have been just like what happened to the Palestinian Authority in the Gaza Strip. And we know today that the Gaza Strip is controlled by the Hamas that killed almost all the Palestinians that were a part of the Palestinian Authority. So it's Israel that is protecting, it's unbelievable, but Israel is protecting not only itself, but it's also protecting the Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinian Authority knows that, and I think they are quite comfortable with that. So if, um, if we should think what would happen without the Palestinian Authority, it's not, it, it's not good news, but the good news is that the IDF is in, in, uh, in the boots on its ground, 
And I hope that the, at least on what's happened between the units, the Palestinians and the Israelis, will continue on, even though mm -hmm. the decision makers haven't yet met for the past four years. Uh, the plurality of questions are about the move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Thank you. Uh, needless to say, a number of Arab countries with which you have good relations, Jordan, Egypt, uh, countries in the Gulf like Saudi Arabia, which has, shall we say, an emerging relationship with Israel, right. uh, thought that this, was, that this move was if, if, premature, perhaps, uh, something that would actually set back their ability to uh, support a, a peace plan if President Trump does issue that peace plan. Could you reflect a little on, on why, why you see it as a positive step as opposed to perhaps waiting to see what the peace process or the peace plan that the Trump administration would bring forward and perhaps getting these Arab countries to come in and, and help to push the Palestinians on that issue. Um, yes, but I have to start with a very big thank you to the administration. It was a historical decision. And I think at the end of the day, and I'll explain myself in a few seconds, the decision will, I think, enable the Palestinians, even though it seems like what I'm saying I, is, is, is not reasonable, it will enable them to eventually uh, forward go forward with the peace process. And why is that? Up to now, the, the Oslo Accords, the logic behind the Oslo Accords was quite logic. I mean, if you thought about it, they said, let's talk about the small issues that we can solve. We can bring a solution to the small issues. And the big issues, will they'll be delayed until the end of the process. Jerusalem, the borders, the refugees, the settlements, those, we won't talk about them now. We'll talk about them at the, begin, at the end of the process. And what happened? We got the Oslo Accords, the Palestinians came, they took over seven cities, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and nothing really happened. The terror just came and uh, the terror just risen again, one, uh, time and again. What the decision about recognizing Jerusalem, the main, I think the main or the most important thing is that the Palestinians understand they don't like it. And that's fine. We had a lot of things that we didn't like as well. They don't like it, but they understand now that Jerusalem is off the table. That can help them understand that the goal, their goal has to be a real, uh, in reality. Because up to now they thought, all Jerusalem will be in, our, in, our, in, in their hands, which was unlogic altogether. All the refugees will be back in the, in the state of Israel. The borders will be exactly where they want to put it. And now this decision of recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel, all of a sudden they understood that, okay, this is where we stand. And it will be difficult for them to, at least at the beginning, to, to, to uh, uh, grasp that. But at the end of the day, they will understand. It's not easy. As I said, Israel also had to take a few uh, tough decisions. As I said, dismantling a, few, uh, a lot of, of settlements. But they will understand. And you know what? I have even more. I will say even more than that. I remember before, the months before the recognition, the Arab world and, uh, the, and, and uh, prominent leaders from the EU, the European Union, they threatened us and they said, if you will, rec if the, the administration, the Trump administration will recognize Jerusalem, the gates of hell will open. Who knows what will happen? The decision was made, and what happened? The sky didn't fall. I know the Palestinians are upset. So what? So they'll have to live with it. We're also upset. We will have to live, each and every one of us will have to live with the understanding that no one will have all his dreams in his pocket. That's how, that's how grown-ups deal with issues like um, life and death. And the recognition of, this, of Jerusalem as the capital of the, of, of, of the state of Israel, I think, was the first decision since the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993 that the Palestinians 
eventually understood that there are issues that will not, they will not succeed in, uh, in, in uh, winning them. And that will help them, and I think it will also help the Arab world, to understand that Israel will stay here and will st keep on existing for, uh, for an eternity, because only if that's the, how they understand things will the peace pre go will a real peace peace uh, uh, treaty be signed between the two entities so speaking of that uh, prime minister netanyahu has publicly stated that that he accepts the idea of a two state solution and one of our uh, audience members says how does israel demonstrate belief that uh, that uh, the existence of a palestinian state would eventually come about and be in its interest uh, and i think that this might have something to do with with the settlements issue right there's what, 650, 700,000 settlers in um, Judea and Samaria more now? More than half a million. Okay. So the, answer, uh, the question is, how does that work out with the... With, with the... Two-state solution. two-state solution. A two-state solution means that each and every, and both of the sides, Israel and the Palestinians, before even talking about how it will happen, the first and foremost thing is to recognize each, each entity will have to recognize the existence of, the, of its neighbor. Israel has recognized the time and again, the Oslo Accords show that Netanyahu himself talked about this two-state solution. He didn't believe in the two-state solution, but he understood that the reality has to make it, and he recognizes that the Palestinian state will belong to the Palestinian people. Up to now, 2018, not one Palestinian leader has ever recognized the existence of a Jewish state. Now, leave aside where the borders will go, what will we do with the settlers, with the settlements, leave that aside. Before that, when you come to a table, you want to know that the other side recognizes you. Otherwise, what are we talking about? And that was the, I think that was the, the big mistake of the Oslo Accords. We came to the table with a lot of trust, and we didn't understand, or we didn't want to understand, that the other side, the Palestinians, came to the table, but they didn't recognize us. So before talking about borders, and before talking about settlement, and before talking about a peace treaty, or the details, we want to know and we want to be sure that the Palestinians recognize Israel. They haven't yet said that. We're, we're waiting, as I said, since 2014, and not, and there's a reason why uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian, the president of the Palestinian Authority, hasn't yet met Netanyahu for four years, because he was, he was told not only by Netanyahu, but I think also by the administration, by the EU, that he has to recognize the state of Israel as a Jewish state, and he, ha and he, and he, and he um, refused to do so. So but without recognizing the state of Israel as the Jewish people, we will not start, nego start negotiating on the details. Right, but this, this is an issue of recognizing Israel specifically as a Jewish state, not the recognition of Israel as a state, which was accomplished in the Oslo Accords, right? Yeah, but, uh, but, hmm. but people have to understand, when we're talking about the recognition of the Jewish state, we're talking about, and I'm not saying, I'm not talking about the borders, Netanyahu say, uh, himself, he said we didn't have yet to talk about the borders of the Jewish state. We're just talking about the understanding that there has to be a recognition of the Jewish state, and that hasn't yet come. And we're waiting for the Palestinians. The Palestinians are trying their best. And they tried, and they have succeeded, I think, up to the administration of Trump. They have succeeded in, in, in I would say, kicking the can and hoping that until the next kick of the can, they'll get a more, more and more um, appreciation from the world, and they receive that. And all of a sudden, comes a president, an administration, and said, enough is enough. We talk business. We would want to know exactly where you stand. And Mahmoud Abbas and all the Palestinian leadership, all of them, I haven't heard one, not the moderate, the most moderate one, hasn't yet recognized the state of Israel. Without recognizing the state of Israel, Israel will not talk about settlements, borders, Jerusalem, refugees. We will not talk about it. It's a waste of time. So therefore, we're waiting for the Palestinians. It's up to them. And they know that, and they, I think, time and again, are trying to maneuver themselves out of the situation, and hopefully, 
that, as I said before, the recognition of the state of Jerusalem as, as the capital of the state of Israel will make them, the focus on them, that they'll have to make a decision. They haven't yet done so. So this follows on from this. One of the questions from the audience is, is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict strictly over territory or is it religious? Depends who you ask. The Palestinians, they, at least that's what, that's what they say, they're talking about a religious conflict. Meaning... But you said that the Palestinians have to recognize Israel as a Jewish yeah, yeah. state. I, right? I, 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 I don't say everything. Yeah. The Palestinians see the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, or you know what, Israel and the Arab world as a, as a religious conflict. Therefore, there's no place for non-Muslims in a Muslim area. That's how they see the conflict. Israel, uh, as opposed to that, wants to have a, a, a Jewish state in its borders, and it doesn't really care what happens outside its borders. It doesn't force itself on anyone else. And if you need more proof, those are the peace, pro peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan, Muslim states. Israel has no uh, uh, um, issues with e Egypt. I would say on the contrary, today Israel has the best and tightest re uh, relations with Egypt and with Jordan. We help them to fight terror. So what we, when we say we, we, that the Palestinians will have to recognize the Jewish state as the, as the state of the Jewish people, that means we would want to, uh, we, we, we will believe them only if they understand that the entity that will be made, that will belong to the Jewish people, will be a Jewish state. And it won't be a state that Jewish, the Jews live in it. Because if that will be the case, then it'll be another step, like the Oslo Accords. They came into the West Bank. They got all the land that they wanted in the West Bank. Now, the next step. That's why we declare that without them recognizing it, it's a waste of time, and that's a big difference between us. We understand that the Muslims or the Palestinians, which are Muslims, they want to have their state with their whatever, their leadership, we understand that. We don't interfere. But same thing on the other side. They shouldn't interfere in, in how Israel sees itself. They should recognize that Israel, as a sovereign country, can decide its own nature, and the nature is a Jewish state, and they haven't yet recognized that. Very simple. Much like uh, Kansas and Duke uh, yesterday, we're in overtime right now. <laughs> but uh, let, let me just ask a couple more questions since we got so many from the audience. So a number of them are about Iran and, and, and the JCPOA. Uh, one can look at the JCPOA and say, uh, despite the fact that Prime Minister Netanyahu was a fierce critic of it, that it in fact has walked Iran back from having uh, uh, maybe less than a year to getting a nuclear capability, or potentially getting a nuclear capability, to, as you said, 10 or 15 years, depending upon how you, how you, read, the, uh, how you read the agreement. And it, it, one can make the argument that, that that's not a bad deal if you're talking about taking a country which has, as you rightly point out, um, threatened Israel on numerous occasions and w walk them back from uh, a, a, a window of less than a year for a nuclear capability to a decade or more, that's, that's not a bad deal. Why is Prime Minister Netanyahu so opposed to that? Well, two reasons. It reminds me of a joke that there's a person that jumps off a cliff and someone asks him, how are you doing? And he says, so far, so good. But So if you stop... But if, they, if, 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 if we hadn't had JCPOA, that jump would have been very short, right? Yeah, yeah. I understand that. One second. So trying, trying to categorize the agreement as a salvation, I think, is incorrect, and I'm being very, very mild. The sunset closure, it'll be five, 10 years, 15 years, but eventually the Iranian, Iranians will have a nuclear, a nuclear weapon. And now you can argue, so, but at least you have 15 more years to live, and that's how we see it. Or 15 more years for things to change, but go ahead. Could be. 
Could be, I'm not saying. But Israel, with its experience, its bad experience, I would say, cannot rely on hopes and dreams. The prime minister today, and that's how he sees things, he doesn't believe a word or the paper or the signature that the Iranians have, have uh, um, uh, signed. He doesn't, just doesn't believe it. Now you can say, as I said before, maybe he's a little paranoid. Could be, could be. But just think what happens, try to understand where he comes from. He cannot have any, he, there's no, he, has not, he, has, he hasn't got the luxury of making mistakes. Because if he is wrong, then who knows, maybe we have 15 more years and things can change. But if he's right, then what will happen? And now the question is, what does Israel have to do? We cannot take, we cannot take the risk. According, I, I really do believe in, in his uh, uh, philosophy. We cannot take the risk. We took the risk in Oslo Accords, and we could have taken the risk. We took the risk, and it wasn't such a good experience for us. But we could have taken it because it wasn't existential. With Iran, for, according to Netanyahu, it's a risk one too far for us to take. Therefore, even if it's 15 minutes, uh, sorry, 15 uh, months, a year, 15 months, or 15 years, when the goal, and that is what we have to see, where do we stand? Where does the Middle East stand? Where does Israel stand? Where does the world stand? Not now. Where does it stand at the end of the process? And according to where Netanyahu sees, it'll stand at the same place with Iran, with the nuclear weapon. Now, you can say those 15 years are very important. Who knows what can happen? Maybe the, the Ayatollah regime will fall top of them. And then, who knows? Could be, hopefully. But we cannot, as a, as, 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 as a, as a decision maker, we cannot rely on hopes. It's impossible for us. As you saw, our neighborhood is a, quite a tough neighborhood. Hoping is nice, it's important, but hoping is sometimes a little dangerous. And if we won't be uh, uh, um, very focused on our existence, you never know what will happen. And I'll give you an example, a very, I would say, a, a, maybe a small, uh, um, it, it could lead to a big issue. The Hezbollah, after the Second Lebanon War in 2006, the war ended by signing, by a, sorry, a United Nations a decision, 1708, which said that the Hezbollah cannot be down uh, close to the to the to Israel's border. I think only from the uh, from the Wali uh, River. Mm. Where do you think today Hezbollah is? Where do they stand? There was a decision by the United Nations, the Security Council, the Arab world, Israel, and where is the Hezbollah today? On the border. 2018, and it wasn't on the border 2018. They're there for at least five, six years. So now I should ask myself, as an Israeli that lives in Israel, how can we rely on people that signed uh, agreements, and a year, two, three years after that, they ignore what they, they signed upon. And that's only, you know, only about 100,000 missiles. We're talking about nuclear weapon. Netanyahu doesn't believe in the Iranians, and therefore there's no difference in his eyes between nine months, 15 months, and 15 years. Because at the end of the day, Israel will be in a danger, in, in existence danger. Therefore, we have to demolish dismo the danger now in any manner that we can. And that is why he, Netanyahu, is doing as best as he can. And unfortunately, he hasn't yet succeeded in, you know, in, 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 in convincing the uh, international community. But that is where, and I think it's very logical. I think that's nothing more humane and, and, and reasonable for a nation to want to um, secure its existence in the long term and not in the long term. 
We've kept you uh, about 20 minutes past when we said we would, so I'm just going to ask you at this point to uh, help me thank the Consul General for his remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.